So my name is Patrick Calloway. I'm the Collections Manager here at MDI Historical. And this week we're going to be doing a regular feature that we do here on Chewbacca Chats. And that is to take a look behind the curtain and to take a look at some of the collections that we hold here at the Society. So the format for this is a webinar format. So please feel free to ask questions and comments using the chat or questions and answers feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, when you use the chat feature, you have the option to send a message to the host, so to me, or to everyone, which includes everybody in the audience. Uh, we'll answer questions at the end of the conversation. Uh, Chewbacca chats are recorded and are available through our website and YouTube channel one week after Eric. So this week, we are going to be taking a look at part of our collections. And in keeping with the theme of island connections that we see in this year's Chewbacca, uh, taking a look at how the island has impacted the larger society and how larger society has impacted the island, uh, we're going to be taking a look at a very interesting part of our collection in the movie posters. So thinking of popular culture, particularly in the 30s and the 40s, as a way of producing a generally accessible type of cultural production that we are seeing that is a community event in at least two ways. So first, that communal experience of gathering together as people to, fill, to view a film or a cartoon or whatever's on the screen but also as a type of connection to people in other places, as the movie stars, the stories, and the films that become so familiar to society at large becomes part of our own culture. So we'll go ahead and take a look at some of the movie posters at, that we have here in the collection, and we'll talk about not only the movies that are being advertised and some of the other elements that we can see, but some of the opportunities and challenges that this collection gives to us as we try to care for the collections. All right, so there should be uh, up on the screen, the tobacco chat, and that is today. So what I've done is that I've taken a look at some of the collections that we have in movie posters and in advertisements and in circulars that would come to people's homes throughout the course of time. So the first that we'll start with is a pamphlet that we have here in the collection for Hollis G. Reed's Neptune Theater in McKinley, Maine. So McKinley, uh, this was the name of Bass Harbor for a short period of time. Uh, this dates to about... Oh, I wrote this down. So about 1938, January or so. So late December, early January of 37, 38. So this would have been a advertisement that would have been sent out as a mailer to the community in order to encourage people to come to the Neptune Theater. So if we take a look inside, we get to have some idea of what the people were actually seeing. It's billed here as Mount Desert Island's Nautical Theater. I'm not entirely sure if this was a directed advertisement towards perhaps fishermen or lobstermen who had been working, or if it's a commentary on the name of Neptune, uh, the god of the sea, uh, as part of the theater name. Uh, either one or both of those is possible. But this gives you an idea of some of the movies that are coming out and would be uh, played locally. So one of the intriguing questions that we have as we look through this collection, and we have a number of different island theaters, is the question over whether or not the movies would come to individual theaters, whether they'd be circulated between theaters. Now, how often would they overturn? Uh, we're just not sure. We do not have enough evidence from the uh, poster collection, and we don't have enough of the posters in the collection to be able to make a good comparison. So... In part, this gives us an idea of the experience, but it leaves us some questions that we can't answer. So going to the movies was very different back then. So we think of the movies today and entertainment more broadly as a very individual experience. So whether we are curating our YouTube feeds, our Netflix feeds, whether we're on the Instatalkagram or whatever the social media of the day is, it is a very individual experience. 
this is a collective experience. So people would gather together and see these different films. So we have a number of different movies here. We would also see some elements that would be added to a film that perhaps would not be today. Things like a Popeye cartoon. And if we think of the Looney Tunes, those were originally designed to be sort of openers for movies. Uh, the Looney Tunes are probably more famous than many of the movies now, but that was their origins. We'll also see things like the Three Stooges and skits and sketches from them as openers for movies. So think of the some of the enduring cultural icons that we have in our own society. This would be the same groups of people and same acts and same films that people of the age would have been exposed to. Part of the challenge of working with these sources is dating and trying to figure out what are these movies, because some of them perhaps are a little bit more famous than others. Many of them, uh, frankly, we've never heard of. Many of the actors or actresses are famous. Now, we're all familiar probably with who Betty Davis is or uh, Claudette Colbert. Some of these are a little bit more obscure. So who these people are and what the films are, this is something that in 1937, 38, they would have known that we do not necessarily do. So the pamphlet is interesting in one other respect, and that is the cost. So if we look towards the uh, right of the screen, so 35 cents for a movie ticket. Uh, it's quite different today. So some of the other artifacts that we have in the collection are posters and tickets. So the poster to the left was for the Park Theater in Southwest, and it gives a list of movies. We're not exactly sure the year. Uh, part of the difficulty that we have in dating some of these sources is that we can go back and figure out when a movie was released, but we cannot necessarily prove when that movie was played. So we can get a roundabout ballpark of when these posters would have been up, but that's sort of a difficult conclusion to reach. So some of these, again, are going to be more famous than others. Uh, the John Wayne and Shirley Temple classic of Fort Apache is a common movie. But this gives you an idea of the different variety of entertainment options that people would have had. To the right, we have movie tickets. So the Criterion uh, up on top, the Star Theater over in, in uh, Bar Harbor. The one on bottom is relatively interesting because if we look closely at the bottom of it, it says that our profit sharing extra thanks for this. Thank you for your patronage. So we're not sure what that actually is. Was there some sort of profit sharing or nonprofit or something in the business model of that time at the Criterion? Uh, we just don't know. So moving forward, uh, taking a look at some of the more uh, movie posters. A park theater again over in Southwest. This selection shows some of the opportunities and challenges that we have here in the collections and collections management. As we can see, especially the one on the right has some tears and some water damage. Uh, it's uncertain when that happened. These posters would have been designed to be posted outside. So whether those were damaged in a rainstorm back in its own era, whether it was some sort of storage issue between when the uh, poster was posted and when it was donated to us, we just don't know. But it does raise some very serious challenges uh, uh, for us as the society in order to appropriately care for and to be able to uh, preserve these artifacts that in many ways are relatively fragile. So taking a look at some of our movie collections uh, here, uh, Loretta Young, uh, reasonably famous. Uh, honestly, I've not heard of most of the people in that one. Uh, over on the right, the interesting one to me is The Fast Company, 
with the cartoon carnival. Uh, thinking again of the cartoons that we've all come to know and love as part of the movie going experiences that they would have had at the time. It's also interesting to see the RCA sound system has almost top billing. This is a very interesting dynamic that we're seeing here that helps us date this to probably the 30s. Uh, talking pictures were a relative novelty, and being able to hear sound from the movies was a relative novelty. So this is going to be something that we're seeing as a changing element of the experience of being able to hear the actors and actresses on the screen. So more from the Neptune. Again, we see some of the conservation and preservation challenges, uh, water damages and uh, terrors. We see an interesting collection of movies here, uh, perhaps a little bit more famous. So uh, Houdini and Moulin Rouge. Uh, we also see some that are potentially uh, a little uh, adult oriented. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what Babes in Baghdad are, and I'm a little afraid to, to Google that. Uh, so, you know, potentially some content there. Uh, what we can, what we think of as the content standards for these old movies really is not developed until 1934. So potentially being able to date some of these movie posters might give us some idea of what these movies would have been like. Many of these certainly have been preserved and are, and we can actually still watch them but perhaps some of these are a little bit more obscure. Let's take a look at another set. So back over to the park. Uh, this one we can date relatively easily, the one on the left, as this is when Bambi is in the theater. So Bambi comes out in August of 42. Here we have it in December. So that gives us a bit of a time lag, probably about a two month, three-month cycle for a movie to get to MDI. This is also interesting in that as we get to 1942, this is going to be a wartime United States. So this is going to be during World War II, what would have been on the movie screens as entertainment for the people here. So we start to see some things, uh, cartoons like Bambi, certainly, but we start to see films that are probably war related, uh, bring them back alive, for example, and suggest that there is a connection between the entertainment and the wartime conditions. So over on the right, uh, another uh, series of movie ads, uh, Ozzy Nelson and Sweetheart of the Campus. Uh, I don't know a thing about it, but I remember my grandma talking about him uh, quite a bit. So. Uh, he was famous. But again, this is going to be to go back to our theme of connections between the island and culture. That's going to be a touchstone that my grandmother from thousands of miles away perhaps would have had a touchstone and a commonality with people who were here. Now we have a bit of a change in our collection. So we have a handful of those clearly 30s, early 40s ads. And then we have a series of posters from the probably the mid 70s, 70s, mid 70s, somewhere in there, where we start to see a changing nature of public entertainment. So moving away from that earlier model of things being the cultural touchstones produced by Hollywood, though the communal gatherings that would come from that, and now to a more still communal, but perhaps more focused type of public entertainment. So we have over on our left, the theater uh, committee of the Harbor House now running the uh, theater. So this is going to be certainly a change from the more chain oriented or studio oriented type of films that we would have seen. To the right, we have a fundraising film. So in the hosted by the neighborhood house, loaned by the New York Zoological Society. And this is presumably a fundraiser of some variety. So again, it is still using that type of communal gathering and entertainment for a, you know, a purpose of gathering people together. 
and for connecting us to a broader society, in this case, New York Zoological Society and films in Australia and in Africa. But the method of approach here is quite different than what we would have seen in those studio-oriented films that we were looking at a little bit earlier. One of the interesting transitions that we see in the collection is that as we get into the 70s, many of the posters either are or appear to be handmade. So this is an interesting change from that very you know, studio-centric type of approach that we saw in our earlier uh, posters. Uh, again, and it shows some interesting connections. I'm not sure what a New York City blackout has to do with the movie playing here on MDI. Uh, it's an, There must be a story here somewhere, but I don't know what it is. Uh, if you have any idea what that connection is, please send me an email because I would be very interested in hearing that. So we have a New York City blackout, and here's the movie as a result. Over on the right, so Jack Benny. Again, a very famous uh, radio personality, actor, TV show, musician. The interesting thing is that it's a tribute to the late Benny. And he dies in 1973, I believe. Uh, but this type of memorial suggests that he had some sort of resonance with the population here on the island. That they would have a memorial playing of one of his movies here to celebrate his life. This is another one, uh, probably handmade. This is a Harbor Theater. So going back to the community run theater now. So W.C. Fields, uh, certainly a very well-known uh, actor. Uh, you can't cheat an honest man, Charlie Chaplin, Laurel Hardy. So going back to some of those 30s and 40s, uh, types of entertainments and popular entertainment. But on the bottom of the poster, we have a note that says, a program dedicated to the memory of Howard Robinson. I'm not sure who Howard Robinson is. And certainly this is a place where if any of you do know the story of who that is or what the connection to Harbor Theater is or to this comedy is, uh, certainly that is something that we very much hope that you will let us know. But here we have an, an interesting com combination of those two ideas of the popular media being both a connection to the external community. So W.C. Fields and Chaplin and Laurel and Harley, Hardy being you know, very famous worldwide, but a very intensely local touch point as well. Uh, Howard Robinson, again, I'm assuming that he was a local person who had some sort of affection for this humor, and that would have been a way of remembering him as people here. So we will go ahead and uh, we'll stop there. Uh, feel free to put any questions into the chat. We have about oh, five or 10 minutes to, to go before we start to wrap up for the evening. So certainly uh, any questions about uh, the collection, the movie posters, uh, any ideas about who some of those people are and some of the stories behind, uh, certainly the uh, forum is open for you. All right, so last call, uh, any 
uh, questions, thoughts, or any information uh, on the posters, uh, please feel free to pop it in the chat. All right, so it looks like there being none. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, next week, we'll be on uh, interviewing Jesse Burchett, who is the author of Plaster and Herring, The Lives of Captain William Heath and Captain David King on Mount Desert Island. So uh, Jesse is joining us from uh, reading over in the UK and is a recent graduate there and from the University of York in historical archaeology. Uh, she was an intern down here at Southwest Harbor uh, and spent some time there taking a look at their collections and some of the collections here at MDI Historical as well. Uh, so please feel free to uh, join us again 4.30 next Thursday and it will be here. And thank you for coming tonight and we look forward to seeing you next week. Have a good night.